We want to welcome you very warmly to the launch of Rob Gordon's book, Ethnologist in Camouflage, Introducing Apartheid to Namibia. And this is an informal discussion, so there's no protocol to be observed. Just know that every one of you is deeply appreciated for having come. And you are so welcome. This is the first book launch we've had in over a year. So we've been very excited and full of anticipation. We organized it in less than a week. And that was solely due to the generosity of our author. He has um, footed the bill for the venue and for the drinks and the refreshments. So please give him a big thank you. So um, now I would like to introduce him briefly, although I suspect he probably knows each one of you personally, because he knows everybody. <laughs> um, Rob Gordon is currently the emer Emeritus Professor at the University of Vermont and a Research Fellow at the University of the Free State. But much more important than that is that he was born here in Bintook and raised, even more importantly, in Ketman's Hope. So this, I think, is his really <laughs> great distinction. His book is about um, policies and events and processes that occurred during his lifetime and during the lifetime of most of us. So I think this is what gives the book its real thrill of excitement. Um, Rob has, has um, just defined what anthropology is for me on Friday when we chatted. He said, you look around society, find something that interests you, and then study it. <laughs> a conversation with him is pretty much like that. He's interested in everything and everyone. Um, primarily the sand, and he's, he's supported and written about them, but um, I think that um, what I'll do is leave him to talk more about himself and the interesting fact that his father was the mayor of Kevin Philip. <laughs> and I'll go on to just briefly describe the evolution of this book. In 2018, um, Rob emailed me uh, with a proposal that we should publish a Namibian or Southern African edition of his book, which has been accepted by both Han books on condition that they were happy for a Southern African edition to be published. Now, both Han books is a big time publisher. Oxford and New York, they produce 100 titles a year. They publish um, around 40 journals. But we were so happy that he came to the University of Namibia Press that we said to him, sorry, not with the title you want, which was Making the Difference. Now we have a book called Making a Difference by Libertine Amadila. So Rob had to change his title. And I'm going to briefly go through the titles, Rob, because I think it's such a lot of fun for a lot of people. He changed to um, the grand delusion, how anthropologists and other experts shaped Namibia. And that was dropped by Berghahn, um, and it came out in their um, edition as South Africa's dreams, ethnologists and apartheid with a cover that Rob didn't like very much, and one that we didn't like either, most definitely. 
And here we have to give um, acknowledgement and thanks to Doris Henriksen of Basler Africa Bibliographia, who um, gave us permission to use the photographs that Rob originally wants, which is on the current cover of the book. And I, I would like to um, acknowledge my colleague Anna Paula Bakamwena, who put the cover design together. And we were really pleased with it because we thought it absolutely reflected the contents of the book. Right. So, um, and what I did want to say about Bergheim is if you had wanted to buy Rob's book from Bergheim, you would have had to pay £89 sterling or 120 US dollars. This translates roughly to 1,800 Namibians. And that's, that's before they send it to you. So you're looking at a, an investment of over $2,200 million to get a copy of his book. And that's why Rob and a number of other researchers are determined to make their research available at an affordable price. So $200 for Rob's book this evening is an absolute steal. But the mission of the University of Namibia Press is to make good research results accessible and affordable to Namibians in the country where the research took place. But we thank Rob very much for, for taking this line. Okay, so now I will briefly introduce the other discussants and then hand over. The four of them have got a lot to say. The book has generated huge interest and enthusiasm because, as I said earlier, um, the events took place within our lifetimes and there was a lot we didn't know. So uh, Rob's research into archives all over the world has really turned up a lot of very interesting new information. So on, on Rob's um, right is Dr. Michael Cooper, currently the director of the Labour Resource and Research Institution. He is also a UNAM graduate and, and then um, um, flew on to the University of the Western Cape where he, well, he obtained his postgraduate degrees and lectured for several years before coming back to the director's post. He is from Kabanga, northeast Namibia, so he has a vested interest in this book, as does um, Shampati uh, Shirema, who's from the same area, Kabango in northeastern Namibia. Um, he has been, he's also a UNAM graduate and has um, quite a lot of experience teaching and, um, as an administrator and currently he's a lecturer in the education faculty um, at UNAM, Commissar Campus. And then that brings me to Cletus Lekua, Dr. Cletus Lekua, who is a UNAM graduate, also went on to UWC. He's also from Kabango, northeastern Namibia. And he is the fastest reviewer I have ever met. <laughs> I asked him to if he would review the book, and I got the review well before I, I thought it possible. And then I must also just refer to um, Michael Cooper's review. We um, realized that it could be made into a preface for the book. So um, we have him to thank for that and also from a number of edits of the indigenous language terms, which Anna Paula also helped with. So we've made this book a truly Namibian um, edition <laughs> in lots of different ways. So thank you, Rob. I'm going to give over to you to run the rest of the discussion. Thank you for coming. Um, please drink and eat. Uh, and, uh, I, I want to try and claim it on my research budget. So, oops. <laughs> um, anyway, it's great to be back in Namibia. It's, 
you know, where I'm from, it's snowing right now, so you can see I'm appreciating this. Um, Joel, thank you very much for this great works and doing such a great job of this book. It's vastly superior to the book on edition. <laughs> no questions asked. <laughs> And I do want to, so I'm an anthropologist, and you know there's this myth that the term anthropology is derived from anthropos and logos, the study of humanity. But if you look in the Greek lexicon, you can translate it as bearer of scandals. <laughs> so I am proud to be an anthropologist. Um, I think it's a very important role which we have is to look at scandals or potential scandals and we can talk about that at the end. Um, let me explain sort of how I got to write this book. Um, after my PhD I got a job in Papua New Guinea and being idealistic, I mean it was an idealistic time, the Prime Minister wrote, drove around in the Datsun Bucky, you know, but it's changed a lot now. Papua New Guinea has imported a lot of Maseratis from the ministers. But it was an idealistic time. And so I decided, okay, PhD in hand, I'm going to do research on what the people did. So it was a good excuse to travel around Papua New Guinea. And everyone said violence is the big issue. So I did a study of what's called rural tribal violence, but what we would call wars, and as I was explaining, I've attended over 50 wars, but they were with bows and arrows, but nevertheless wars. And so when I got my job, I started teaching a course called Law, War and Disorder. I might mention that the way my approach was heavily influenced by the local Quakers in Port Moresby, and looking for alternatives to violence. And that came, then I sort of met John Marshall. Oops. They can't hear me? Oh, okay, great. <laughs> I hate holding those phallic symbols. <laughs> um, so I worked with John Marshall on the Bushman, and then, of course, the logic there was all these anthropologists are studying the Bushman. I made to look at the role of the Bushman within the wider society. And I was involved with a human rights organization called Cultural Survival. And then some anthropologists wrote a petition protesting about the militarization of the Bushman. And I knew nothing about it. So I thought, what the heck, how do you create copy? I mean, there's a journalist here. You write a letter to all the anthropology departments in South Africa. And you say, hey, you know, can you comment on this? And I got this most amazing response from the professor at Potchefstroom, who then forwarded my letter to the chief ethnologist of the SADF. And he wrote about four pages, single-spaced, complete watch. I mean, there's no <laughs> other word to explain it. Um, so what do you do when you get stuff like that, when you build a file and you start collecting stuff on the military, and the role of the military in anthropology? And I might mention that the first professorship in anthropology was created in 1865 in the Dutch Military Academy. There's a very interesting role between anthropology and the military, and we can talk about that. It's not just the SADF, the Germans did it, the British did it, the Americans did it, they really screwed up in Vietnam and in Afghanistan. And that's interesting because if you trace the rule root of military ethnologists in South Africa, <coughs> right back to Magnus Milan when he was doing courses, staff courses in America. So I kept that. So that was the first <coughs> point. That was one of the turning points. Then the second turning point, oh, I, did I mention, you didn't mention, I went to Stellenbosch University, you know, the Harvard of Africana. It was a real nice place. Plus, <coughs> there was the Africa when I was there. Um, so Jonathan Janssen, the rector at the University of the Free State, invited me to spend time in Bloemfontein. And you know, people joke about Bloemfontein. Papers and all the book papers. And Brumbert, since I'd heard a lot about him and since he'd worked on Namibia, I started looking through his papers. And I, what I found was a remarkable story. 
Um, he'd been a missionary in Malawi, so he was interested in the matrilineal belt, which goes right through to the Kalele. Um He turned down an MBE because he was here. The Boer War was still very much in his mind. He got his PhD from Iceland. Got a job at Stellenbosch, was heavily involved in SABRA, which is the South African Bureau of Racial Affairs, which basically tried to provide an intellectual basis for apartheid. Uh, but at the same time, he was a member of the Buddha Board, and he was a rapid riser. He was, in next to no time, he was chairman of the discussion group about African affairs, onto affairs, as it was called. But being an anthropologist interested in matrilineal societies, he worked in a body. And because he's following that, but at the same time, being a member of the AP, he would get special leave from, the, from Stellenbosch University to do research here. But at the same time, he was spying on Swapa. He was reporting on Swapa. And his major claim to fame in his memoirs, he says, when Carpio came to this country. That's, none of you remember Kafia, do you? No. Um, he claims to have successfully persuaded Toivo to stop a mass protest march. Um, anyway, he spends a lot of time traveling around. He's the organizer, the inspiration for the Gwyndal Commission, which becomes very important. It's the first and probably the only effort to impose large-scale grand apartheid, buying up homelands and trying to create things. And what intrigued me was, this is such an absurd idea. I mean, even when I was doing field work in Okamba in the 60s, people were laughing. They were saying, how could Dhammaland or Namaland ever become independent? This is the most absurd idea. So the question then came, I mean, Robert was a highly intelligent person, a very moral person devout Christian, how do intelligent people make stupid ideas or get stupid ideas and follow them? And it's a universal problem. It's not restricted to Afrikaners. It's a global problem. How the right people screw up. And so what I did was I started doing an analysis of the Budabont and the role of secret societies and how that shackles the imagination and stops you from moving beyond it. So that is the part which I got into. At the same time, I started attending, visiting Namibia, and I met some of these military ethnologists. And I went to the, the Academy for Tertiary Education. They had a racial sensitivity seminar, which I managed to attend. And there, a military ethnologist gave a lecture and he was making, the person was making statements like, oh, the reason why Herrero love flies is because they know there are lots of flies, there's got to be manure nearby, which means there are lots of cattle nearby. Great logic. Another one of the vignettes which I remembered, which I have in my notebooks, is the reason why Africans push whites out of the way getting into elevators is because in traditional Bantu society, the Impi go in to see if there are assassins lurking there. Mm -hmm. And the scary part was, I looked at the people attending this seminar, and none of them were laughing. They were writing it down seriously. Mm -hmm. So I thought, this is interesting, and then my theoretical approach sort of emerged from that. There's a great thinker, Erwin knows about Moritz Julius Bach. Probably none of you have heard of, but you should follow him. He did his doctorate, studied, he wanted to go to the most backward part of Europe to do his doctorate, which happens to be Ireland. So he goes there, he has a great time with William Butler Gates and all these people, and he writes this wonderful book about the backward areas of Europe. But then he decides he's going to test Hobson's theory of imperialism. Travels around the Sutu, meets Marengo in Polsdor prison. Then Munich University says, hey, go up to Namibia because they're having some trouble there. So he comes up here, 
And why? Because he's Jewish, he has a lot of racism from the Prussians. And while he's clicking his heels and pinto, he has an insight, he has the epiphany. He says, colonialism is not only racist and exploitative, it's also ridiculous. And that's the way I pick up. I think we've got to look at the ridiculousness. And he becomes very interesting. He's the first European scholar to talk about the necessity of decolonization in 1922. And it's fascinating that no one knows about this dude. Um, but that's because he was a wandering scholar. He didn't have any PhD students or acolytes who sort of build on his stuff. So I've started looking at Namibia as a, and colonialism as a form of ridiculousness. <coughs> Where that becomes important is, if you read Steinbeck, <coughs> the thinkers about colonialism, they say the key to understanding colonialism is this thing of native policy, which is what makes it different. So you've got the natives, and if you have natives, you've got to say, us and them. So the key, this is sort of some of the thinking, we can discuss that later on. And that's why making the difference with <laughs> the original title, because what these anthropologists were doing was emphasizing the difference. And in my book, I've decided to emphasize the similarity. So I look at fieldwork as a form of divination, which people use to divide what's happening, because Gravel is obsessed with looking for the undercurrents, which is what diviners do, yeah, if you see, trying to locate it. So anyway, um, then I got this big file on, oh, Bloemfontein is near Pretoria, so I went to the SAPF archive and started looking at counterinsurgency operations, and that's, I think, what these folks are going to be talking about. Um, there were some really shady characters posing as anthropologists in this country, um, which well, I'm happy to talk about, but I'll let these gentlemen talk first. We can have a discussion on it. If you read the book, that's meant to provoke. Um, and I'll, you know, I, I hope we have a debate because I think these are serious issues. If you look at it, it also touches on this current trendy thing called fake news. Because why people can't see that, you know, how do you counter fake news? How do you counter these crazy theories? Thank you, thanks a lot, and good evening to you all. Uh, let me also greet my teachers who are here, and also my librarians who are also here from my time when I was at UNA. It's a pleasure to see you again. I, I think, first of all, I need to thank you, because um, in, in, in the project of this book, we have really connected many dots that, has, that, that did not have any connection. And, and, and I'm saying this uh, personally because I was also working on these issues that you have just mentioned. Uh, I wrote about nationhood, and uh, having to write about nationhood, there was no way that you could not really engage the archive, um, uh, the colonial archive of Namibia and so on. Um, that being said, I think it's then also important to speak about the discipline itself, anthropology. And I, I think I like uh, I like to think, uh, you know, being the, the bearer of uh, <laughs> of scandalous <laughs> news. Um, that maybe having, it to, having to bring it to the context of the country where you will realize that there are very few anthropologists. And, and I think I'm not shy of it to mention that I ended up doing anthropology by, by, by accident because I actually didn't really know what anthropology was. Um, and just because I wanted to do postgraduate studies, I saw an advert. There was funding from Basel, Carl Friedman, uh, Foundation, I, 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 and then there I was, and I ended up doing this thing. And it really became very interesting for me because um, I started to ask questions as to why in Namibia it is not really that known. And, 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 it, and it's really just a step from what Robert said to say that um, during the war time of, 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 of liberation in Namibia, mm -hmm. we found there were a lot of ethnologists or folk attenders as they were known by the time. And then the stigma then that, that, that we felt the, 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 the discipline thereafter. And, and, and when I interact with my friends from West Africa, where they actually totally stopped speaking about anthropology, but that they would rather speak about the sociology of the Yoruba or the sociology of the Igbo. So that's how problematic the, the discipline actually 
uh, uh, became. Um, um, to say, were you recording what you are seeing? Were you critically engaging what you are seeing? And which, which is what he has done, because uh, in this book and the other work of his that I have read, um, he, he, for me, as, 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 as a student of anthropology at the time, it was always enabling me to see perhaps what my supervisor is not quite clearly saying, or what, the, what I'm reading in text is not quite clearly coming out clear. So this really also um, uh, opened up um, uh, spaces to look uh, the discipline through the racial lines, uh, or you know, being white in anthropology and being black in anthropology, and having a white supervisor who might probably not understand uh, from the perspective where you are writing from. So I think these are some of the issues that came out from looking at, uh, at, at the discipline at the time. So the other thing is to say that maybe um, I had the universities also opening up anthropology. I, I don't know whether it's true, but I've heard something like that. Um, I think it needs to be Namibianized uh, if something like that is to happen. To say, what, what anthropology is it that you want to do? What should be the topics about? And who should perhaps even uh, should government also have a hand in it in terms of um, uh, supporting uh, this, this kind of scholarship? Because you see, and, uh, and as you are going to read in this uh, nice book, that many of these ethnologies were funded by the government through various agencies. So what came out of that in this project, and what can we do with it uh, uh, if we have to Namibianize our own anthropology? Uh, the, what I like about the book is the it is how Rob struggles over various key topics of the history of the country. Um, from, from really uh, beginning to, uh, to engage the, the, the interwar um, uh, irrelevance and vis-a-vis -vis the discipline, and then how he moves to the post-war, uh, post-Second World War, and where the discipline really started also to reform. Um, when you look at some of the texts that came about around that time. And really coming to identify this Bouvet and with whom, when you look at various other ethnologists who were, who were largely also Afrikaner, where their writing were not quite, really, quite different from what he has been writing. So um, one would say uh, maybe there were also politics of this kind of academy at the time that you may not get a scholarship if you are not going to write about this, or you may get a scholarship if you are going to write about this, but this, this is something that has been going through my mind. Um, and then really come the issue of the, the representation at the International Court of Justice, um, where the, the, the question of, say, best slash Namibia has been engaged, um, and also moving to, um, uh, to, to, to the issues of the, of, of, of the Bushmen or Khoisan, if you like. Uh, to be politically correct today, um, where it actually even raises questions today as to how we should study the Bushmen if, if we have classified. But then when you look into the disciplinary debate or critique that has been going on, it's that one of singling out certain people to say that these are the type, and these are the type that may perish if they are not well conserved or well taken care of, and if they are not to be kept in a reserve where they can continue to live their own, their, own, their, 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 their own way of life. So I think that is really where uh, this book really begin to open up for those who would be, want to be anthropologists, or for those who are keen to reading anthropological text, to say that there is, there is that um, interface from what anthropology was, or ethnology, or photo candy, to what it has become, because now, we, have, we are writing, engaging with topics. We are writing, critiquing um, uh, with, 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 with certain topics. Now, writing anthropology in post-colonial Namibia or independent Namibia is actually also a very different uh, story because uh, it can also make you an enemy of the state, especially if you are writing in the critical sense on topics that, um, that, that may not seem palatable or taste palatable uh, to, to those that are here. Um, one of them is, for example, when um, I wrote in one of my papers to say that the post-colonial order, in other words, that the, 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 when the nation happened, there was no clear ways as to how this nation was going to be built. So you, 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 end up, you end up creating enemies along the way because you, 
you, you, you be, seem to be saying that people do not really have a clear mind and agenda of what it is that they're supposed to, to do. But when you look at the model of what was happening from 1995 up to the early 2000s, it's exactly the same uh, of the activities that have been uh, performed by, uh, by Jan Reti or those, uh, or, or Elrich Duterius, when we were seeing, for example, the Comoro in, 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 in Northeastern Namibia. Moving to winning the hearts and minds, um, I think for me what came out and I was telling him also the other time was the name Pash. Uh, this figure uh, is so known by natives, uh, but they didn't even know how to write his name. And when you look at the local government archive, you will not find his print. But he was able to bring it out from outside. And I think for those who are in the archive in, in, uh, sector or industry, really must start to look to it so that some of these things really um, either declassified or classified so that students can really begin to look into these things uh, and write about them. And by the way, many people have already died in any case. So um, not that uh, it, it is, it's good that people have died, but we have to go and support them. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so the, the, the other thing is, um, it, it is the towering figure of Kuwait in, in, say, West Africa. Um, and the whole implementation of this plan, this grand plan uh, of, 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 of really um, implementing the, uh, the, the, the system that was here and how it has played out over the years. And maybe one should also start to question whether um, the system was successful because it stayed on for a very long time, or, uh, and, 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 and whether there were successes also in the system or not. And what is that we are that, that we're looking at as we move forward, also uh, looking at some of these uh, critical questions. I think for now we can see so that the other colleagues can also see something. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, as I was introduced, my name is Sandra Pseri, and uh, I am a historian by training and a teacher by training. Uh, I spent most of my time doing research and writing on the history of the Namibian people. And this book is one of the most valuable gifts that I've ever received in my life. Based on the experience that I have on the work of writing history since I left the university. That's why perhaps I'm coming here. So thank you very much, Professor Robert Gordon, for coming up with this book, or for writing this book. It, uh, for me, it, it is like you have written it for me, <laughs> personally. So, it uh, resonates so much with what I've done and what I've experienced in my life. Uh, the worm winning the hearts. Of course, in the late 80s, we were young, the children, about 10 years old. So we attended some of these events that uh, uh, Professor Gordon is writing about. A Zuba event where the village is called to, to witness magicians and the military comes to see in the village and all. Who are the children? It resonates when you read the book. So it also resonates that uh, for us coming from the northeastern part of, my, of the country, <laughs> that is Kavango area, Caprivi, those areas. The question that has always been asked by the people in those regions is, why is it that we don't have a history in this country? We don't have a history. When we go to school, the history textbooks doesn't reflect the history of the people from those areas. We, it has been asked when we're in university, it has been asked when we left university. It is still being asked today. 
So far, I mean, that's why when we went to university, a group of us, including Dr. Rikua here, I see Alois, my brother Alois Kapuru there, and many others. Every time it was part of uh, the discussion that we had. And uh, as for us, the two of us who were attending historical studies, we, I think we came at the university at the right time because there were men and women who manned the history department who, who had the pedigree to, to, to change the course. And in our studies, we were being taught that we must make a difference. The history that we have should be changed. And one of the critical topics that we were given was the, 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 the review of, uh, by the late Brigitte Lau of uh, one of the earliest ethnologists and historian of this country called Heinrich Wedder, whose work was so much acclaimed by the old regime that it was Alpha and Omega, it was the history. But uh, the late Brigitte Lau wrote a very interesting review, scathing review actually, of that work, which revealed the incompetence and actually the shoddy work that Heinrich Weder did in writing the history of this country. And we took it from there. So when we left the university, we left the university to go out there and make a difference. To write a history where there is not one. And uh, surprisingly, when we were trying to do that, we came into crossfire <laughs> of an ethnologist, because an ethnologist who was assigned to that region, to that area, thought that she has done so much, she has written so much, and who are we to come up with a history which is actually challenging that? And let us were written out to actually intimidate to intimidate us into submission. But surprisingly, probably because we knew a breed, eh? surprisingly we never caught up. From there we launched also to respond. And the response, the discourses went on until perhaps it was realized that these people will never stop. So the lawyers had to come in to bring the whole debate to an end. So we said, the debate can end, but the writing of our history will continue. We will not stop. Only death will do, will make us stop to write our history. So, this book has written, I mean, has come up with a lot of things which really resonate. For example, Professor Gordon talk about the work of ethnologists in which how, how they actually uh, concealed, use the word concealing, blocked off and closed off the understanding of the Namibian past. That is exactly, that is exactly we, that we, we have also picked it up in the reading of this history that were written by the ethnologists. So, we have a situation where, of course, you have something written about your people, but that is actually not to, to contribute to the understanding of the society. And we have been working against this. And we have also come to realize in this book, because we did not know that before the coming of this book, we knew that there were state ethnologists that were employed by the state to write that they were actually ethnologists that were working together with the SDA, uh, SADF, 
the South African Defense Force. In fact, according to this book, written by our professor here, those technologies that were employed for each homeland, they were employed by the SADF. They were working for the SADF. Therefore, whatever research or writing that they published during that particular period, 1975 to 1989, that particular period, whatever they wrote, whatever they published, I think somehow must be regarded as a diversionary work or shadow knowledge because it was not their main job description. Their job description was to advise the SADF and to spy on the people. So the etiquette manuals that were given to the SDA, SDA for Swate for Kukut advising them how to uh, deal with the black people or the, 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 the suspect, the terrorist, is of very, interest, of very particular interest to me. If more of these are to be discovered, I think we'll be able to understand in detail the work of ethnologists. Because, for example, growing up in Kawango, we knew that an Oshuango person, for example, an Oshuango man, in order for him to confess to his crimes or to his terrorist activities, you must cut off his head first. Hmm? <laughs> yeah? So this kind of uh, views, I think, were promoted, I think, I suspect, were promoted by ethnologists in a way to divide the people, in a way to encourage violence in the American society. So, but for now, we don't have conclusive evidence for that. Only that time when all these uh, ethic, I mean, uh, ethic, etiquette manuals will be found. I read that you only found five. five. I think most of them will be, have been bent or have been thrown away or whatever. We have to search for these etiquette manuals. Surprisingly, also, the oral materials for the history of whatever that the ethnologists wrote for the people of the homelands, they are not found even in the National Archives today. I, I see my brother, Mr. Vena Hillebrecht here, he can testify. Those oral materials are not at the National Archives. So we ask ourselves, if they were working for the state, they should be there. Because the state was paying them, and in terms of state succession law, these <coughs> properties that were owned by the previous state must be transferred to the new state, which is the state that we have to do. And those materials are not there. And this is one of the questions that we must ask. Perhaps, where are the materials that these ethnologists collected during that particular time. So, are they classified? Are they bent up? Or are they kept in private archives? So we should uh, work to, to find all this because it is only then we will be able to tell that what they wrote is actually scientific. Otherwise, without those materials, whatever they wrote should be regarded as diversionary work and shadow knowledge. Uh, yeah, I have a lot to say because I said this book. I feel like it was written for me because it resonates so well. So I think for now I would like to thank you, <coughs> Professor Robert Gordon. I met you before. You are part of the poison that I become. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When I was about 20 years old, for 21, Professor Robert Gordon came from America, I think, to come and teach at UNAM for a month. So I wrote in a conference, I read somewhere, uh, knowledge is power, but power defines what knowledge is. I stole it from 
one of the chapter that you wrote. <laughs> so I think, thinking about it, you are actually one of the people that uh, influenced the outlook that I took on this kind of thing. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak at this book launch. Uh, I like uh, speaking by preparation, reading my work, but uh, my colleagues, every time I sit with them, <laughs> they, they speak so openly from their own heart but that I'm tempted to speak without anything. And uh, then I move out of topic, which I don't want to do. <laughs> which I don't want to do, so I'll stick to, to what I've prepared. But uh, there, is all, there is that thin line between anthropologists and historians, uh, especially in terms of whether they are the same or different. And there has always been this criticism, uh, sort of like uh, a funny way of of making fun of the anthropologists. One statement that I came across is that uh, anthropologists need to decide either to be historians or to be nothing. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so there is always that thin line between historians and anthropologists. That's why we always find ourselves in the same space. When I was at UWC, I think the same time with uh, uh, Mike Akupa here. Uh, I remember at the time there was uh, they did not have a lecturer in the anthropology department. So I was asked, I think uh, was it Diana Gibson or someone, that uh, maybe you should teach this module. Uh, Peopling of Africa was the name of the module. Peopling of of Africa. So I I took it up, started teaching. In, I was in the history department doing my PhD but I took up to teach this module in anthropology. And I thought it was the best thing to do, and it was really, but then I made a mistake to inform my supervisor <laughs> in the history department <laughs> that I have been hired by the anthropology department <laughs> to help teach. Uh, well, I, instead of being praised, I was seriously uh, <laughs> You know? Yeah. Caution. <laughs> okay, it's okay to hang around with Michael and but don't be pushed so much because you are a historian. You should not be pushed so much to go the anthropology way. So yeah, so there is always that thin line. And I think when I wrote my PhD finally, it was on a contract labor system in Namibia, voices from the Kalango, the study of uh, contract labor system in Namibia, looking at 1925 uh, uh, until 1972. Uh, one of the interesting books that I read as part of the literature review certainly was by Professor Gordon, Mine, Migrants and uh, Masters. Uh, yeah, yeah, and Masters. That was the name of the book. It's about contract uh, laborers also. But uh, as he explained in his book that for him what was the interest there was to try to understand why did these uh, contract laborers decide to leave contract and to go back home? Right? What were the reasons for them to decide to leave the contract work and go back home? And that was interesting uh, reasons uh, that, uh, that, that he wrote. So that also gave me an interest to relook now at maybe why did they go there? Right? So he was interested on why did they leave, right. but I came to get an example of why did they go. So thank you very much uh, for <coughs> uh, uh, being at the forefront of uh, not only anthropology, but the thin line between anthropology and history. So we, have, we always have a lot to learn as, as historians. So I'm very thankful, first of all, that uh, I'm also a reviewer of uh, this book. Uh, and I'm uh, very thankful to Yunnan Press uh, that uh, we have been given this opportunity to be reviewers. And uh, so the book, this book by Gordon, when I read it, central role of uh, ethnologists in introducing apartheid to Namibia. And uh, as I read uh, the whole uh, 
narratives or the whole writing, uh, I think Gordon brings to light the complex relationship that existed, especially between the colonial government and their so-called knowledge experts, academic institutions, in crafting these uh, uh, political ideologies, especially that was useful in the controlling and subjugating of the colonial subjects. And uh, Gordon, for example, indicates how the colonial fear of foreign scholars, he speaks about the, foreign, the fear of the foreign scholars, especially in carrying out research among Africans, how this, for example, led to uh, the control of uh, the data collection amongst the community. And I thought uh, this speaks out so much about, uh, this speaks volume to the plight that many academics um, faced during the, during the colonial period, especially in terms of accessing information for publication. Now, the written outputs of uh, most of these ethnologies <coughs> that Gordon speaks about or writes about, and as it has been rightly said by the other colleagues, most of these writings that they collected during the colonial period, uh, well, it actually, they, they exist, and it meant actually that after Namibia's independence, the history, the cultural writing of Namibia has mainly been dominated by these contested research outputs of uh, these ethnologies. And uh, it actually now allows for an urgent need, I thought, of uh, going the way, thinking of decolonizing, uh, uh, decolonizing the educational curriculum, maybe both at school level and also at uh, tertiary levels. And I think it links up to what uh, Mr. Shiremo had said on the whole question of uh, where is our history? What is written about our histories? Uh, some, it's not that it's not there in schools or even at the universities, but uh, maybe it also speaks to what people want to see uh, in, in, in the history books. And it speaks about the whole question of decolonize, decolonizing. Subsequently, this also then raises the question, and I thought and I kept thinking about it, as to what should actually, if we have to think about decolonization of uh, the education curriculum, what should encompass the role of the uh, Namibian government or the state, academics and academic institutions, especially towards this whole project of uh, decolonizing uh, the curriculum? We know that we know now that uh, during the colonial periods, academic institutions were at the forefront of shaping uh, the educational systems, or not, for, for the sake of maybe. Uh, controlling or colonizing the minds of, of our people. But uh, what, what, what should be the role of academic institutions, uh, the state, in terms of after independence, in terms of uh, decolonizing the curriculum, working towards uh, decolonizing the minds uh, of uh, most of our people? And Gordon's discussion centrally uh, looks at, uh, for example, how ethnologist efforts uh, I mean, he looks, for example, at uh, how the Bushmen myth was represented, the marginalization, I think, uh, that he speaks about in his book. And I thought that uh, uh, the discussion by Gordon about the marginalization of uh, the Bushmen, or uh, the, the proper way that you spoke of this, the, the Koisa, right. Uh, I think it speaks to uh, colonial failed projects. Uh, especially in terms of uh, uh, developmental, uh, I mean, the colonial field projects on community development, especially on the sun. We have seen, for example, the attempts to, to, to develop, uh, I think in Western Caprivi, we have the case of, uh, uh, what is this community? The developers in, yeah. So if you look, for example, at uh, the situation of, uh, the communities, the sun, uh, in that area, it, uh, it leaves so much to be desired. So it shows an example of uh, failed uh, South African attempts towards uh, maybe developing the sun-speaking communities. And it also brings us now to, I, th I think uh, that failed project, for example, it has left so much for the Namibian state to think about. I think after independence, uh, our Namibian is taking off from where the colonial government left in terms of our developmental projects for these marginalized communities. 
And uh, so, and I've just been thinking that uh, maybe what what can we, what can post-colonial Namibia learn from the failed apartheid uh, South African attempts or efforts to deal with sun development, the uh, development issues, and what should be the role of academics, institutions, we are the academics in these uh, developmental agendas. Uh, we have the issue of, uh, I think, not only in Karango uh, East, but also now in the Persia area, there's been so much ongoing, especially the struggle of the sun on the whole question of marginalization. So it leads, so that colonial field project on the sun still bears so much on after independence. There's so much left uh, inherited from the colonial government to the right and Namibian government, especially in terms of what should they do uh, to deal with the sun uh, plight, the developmental issues. So, Gordon highlights the extreme forms also of colonial violence, I think, in his book. Uh, when you read his books very well, uh, especially uh, looking at the Win Heart Mind concept that I think uh, Dr. Cooper spoke about, where they were trying to, to win the hearts, especially the heart and minds of, uh, of the young people. Uh, I think there's so much impact of Azula. And uh, Shiremo had spoken about uh, how almost everyone, one way or another, got affected. For us as young people, when all these things happened, we were very small, as he said. For some of us, we thought it was fun. We were seeking for fun. Right? <laughs> so you will see the soldiers coming, playing their drums. And for, for us, it was fun. You will run around following them, and uh, they are playing their drums. They have a lot of food to eat. We'll go and eat food, we'll get the dishes. <laughs> and when you see the swap or the nantos, for example, yeah, also coming up with their match, right? Marching through towns or wherever in the village, all of us as young people will be following them. Not because we wanted to be serious swap or activists or nantos mm -hmm. members, but because we were young people looking for fun. Right? So, and we'll be following all, all these events. So, one way or another, we, we have followed this event, and it's good. From Gordon, you, you show that uh, for the colonialists, that this was not just a normal way of having fun with the community. It was actually a form of winning hearts and minds. Somehow, it was a soft, soft violence. Uh, soft violence. It's, it was a violence on the community in a very soft way, winning hearts and minds. And I think in, his, in the same book, Gordon shows uh, uh, the opposite of this soft violence, win and heart mind, to the physical violence, especially that was submitted out on the community previously before the win heart mind by the colonial officials, like uh, the commissions. We know, for example, that uh, in former Gamboland and Kavango, for example, we have heard of uh, commissioners such as uh, Shongola, maybe you've heard of him, the whip. And uh, you have heard of uh, some of the public floggings uh, by Commissioner uh, Shongola uh, in the 1920s. Eh? Okeha, yeah? Yes, he was called, yes. So, doing public flogging uh, of community members, yeah? Naked, in public, right? Uh, and uh, I think. There are also some violence given by Harold Eads and some of his workers. But it's interesting that uh, all this violence by commissioners, they are hardly, uh, uh, they hardly report about them. They, they didn't report on their own violence. We don't find it in the archive to say, okay, I'm Shangola here and I'm reporting how I meted out violence on this community. We don't find that. We only find the good part. What is this violence? Uh, is the archive hiding something, Mr. Werner, that we don't know? The violence of uh, the community. So it's very interesting that uh, Prof. Gordon brings this out. And uh, Prof. Gordon builds on, I think he mentioned Moritz Sabon, whom we don't know so much, uh, but who was a very great scholar who, uh, that he learned something from. He uses the insights to analyze the thinking around this ethnology studies, in which he concludes, uh, Gordon concludes that uh, maybe it was never intended to be the true objective 
examination of the local culture, but rather to serve the ulterior motive of discovering the local cultural secrets, and which actually, as he says, made the whole exercise futile and very foolish. And uh, Gordon places this technology scholars through the lens of Apasia, a, a group closed thinking system, and casting doubts on this false information uh, of these uh, scandal mongers, as he calls them, he has hoped to push them to realize that uh, others could rethink the same issues differently. And this is very, very important that comes out from the book. So, overall, I think the book, uh, it has uh, strong points, uh, uh, very useful information, and uh, it will be useful to both historians and uh, anthropologists, especially those who have an interest understanding the role of these uh, ethnologies in the making of Namibia's colonial past. So, we are very much thankful. I don't want to put too much salt to well-cooked food, so I think I'll let you thank you. I would like to say, empires actually always had embedded anthropologists. The Romans actually had them. They needed them. See, there was actually no way of having a divided rule system without embedded anthropologists. But the thing is, the embedded um, anthropologists were actually not the strategists. They were actually also military strategists. And we actually are at the beginning of understanding see, what kind of, see, of, of strategy actually happened. Now, uh, I looked up to see Patrick O'Malley in the Mandela kind of thing. He actually talked about uh, the Caprivi. Uh, in the Caprivi there were so-called death camps. And the people who were there were the Inkata, Gachapodonese people. And they were trained there. And as a matter of fact, I mean, the Gachapodonese people then, later on, of course, what you see in, in Peter Mara's book and places like that, you see into, into fights with the ANC. And uh, you, you probably know, you see, that, that the situation, you see, that Mandela found himself uh, in 1994 was actually very dire because see, there was a real civil war going on. And Gacha Bhutanese was actually practically supported. And of course, there were strategists, you know, and some of them, you see, were actually, of course, you see, Americans uh, and, and whoever, you see, I mean, Bolt, Cervella actually started to write things about that. You can actually look up, you see, the assassination. He, however, our he is actually not very well right, you see, in, uh, in Namibia. Not, not very much, you see, in, in, uh, in South Africa either. But the thing is, is, we actually still have to find out, we need the, the archives, the confidential archives, you see, of all these boring parties that were actually going on. And as I said, of course, Sue Williams actually wrote a book, see, which is called uh, White Menace. And she, she talked, talked about, you see, what exactly, I mean, the CIA, to sort of, I mean, spread that, I mean, uh, I actually want, want to actually mention that, see, I personally uh, was a teacher of uh, JMTC, and our hero, was actually Nelson Alexander, who actually taught us the decolonizing history, uh, even at that time. If you actually want to, there are three essays about the see, Hedieros, which he researched, you see, in Freiburg. Uh, and, I mean, uh, he, what, what he actually did, you see, is just amazing. And the second was, was actually also just an amazing organization, you see, in changing, you see, uh, education. Now, unfortunately, of course, you see the, the, uh, the NIP, which really Abrahams and whatever, they were actually dissed immediately in 1990 because you see, they were not in Lusaka. And I mean, that is, a, I don't know whether they were, they might have actually have been as well, but we, we actually still have a lot of things actually to, uh, to, to say. As I said, you see, the research, you see, in, 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 to the whole sort of uh, the really military strategies that people actually use. That is actually still at the beginning. And I, I don't want to sort of, I mean, whitewash, you see, the, 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 the ethologists, you see. But they were not actually the, the main for names. They were actually the useful idiots.
<laughs> um, yeah, just to respond to useful idiots. Yes, I, in fact, let me say I admire Quebec. Yes. I think he's a remarkable person because after he had all these grand ideas and then he was an activist anthropologist. He became Commissioner General in Obama, but he was kicked out after a year. And the reason why he was kicked out, he had written a memorandum on the plight of the Bushmen. And there were 13 copies of Thunder Batu who had for which year said, if this memorandum goes public, a world court case is sunk. And Brubert had to have this humiliating experience of collecting all 13 copies and giving them to the minister for that to burn in his presence. Um, but then what's interesting too, towards the end of his days, he writes this thing to the Brudabon saying, Mensa also is deeply a part is not going to work, we've got to do something else. And what I admire about Rubert is he had the power to doubt, mm -hmm. which Rubert never had. And this is the key thing which I hammer in my students. Our basic humanity rests on our ability to doubt what we believe and go beyond that. That makes us human. So that's also, I, I would say, you know, there are 57 flavors of anthropology, and I'm proud to be an anthropologist. I have no doubt about it, I've become one again. My take is very different to the ethnologists. Um, I argue in my book, quite probably, you know, it's going to cause a bit of a ruckus. I say, look, the strength of anthropology is no one really takes us serious. Um, <laughs> Truly, I mean, you read these books and people say, oh, I'm a keen amateur anthropologist. You don't get anyone saying, oh, I'm a keen amateur physician or a keen amateur economist. But you find frequently, I'm a keen amateur anthropologist. So my argument is basically at the end is that the role for the anthropologist, the one I sort of like, is we've got to become the court jesters in late capitalism and just talk truth to power. And that's why I like this idea of looking at the absurdity of the colonialism. It, it resonates with my approach on life. I don't take myself seriously. I hope you critique me. I mean, there's nothing nicer than having a good argument and saying, you're talking bullshit. Um, but then I'm a farmer, and we all know that bullshit is good fertilizer, so you never know what you do ideas <laughs> um, But yeah, I, 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 I you know, and I, I'm an activist too, but you know, I, I think that getting grey, I think that the only thing that we can do as an activist anthropologist nowadays, and I, I have, now I'll tell you all about my activism days if you're interested, but that will bore you. But our secret to success is to, we can't really change society, right? and that's what we should do, is embarrass the rich and the powerful. And that's basically my sort of credo as an anthropologist. There's a saying in America, which I'm surprised isn't an Obambu saying, uh, you've got to stir the pot occasionally and to prevent the scum from rising to the top. And that's basically what I think I do on <laughs> Stir the pot. <laughs> Any more questions, comments? Yeah, under. Uh, well. Well, let me stand up. First of all, a warm congratulations. I have read the book, but uh, I've read, as you know, a lot of your work, and uh, I've been greatly stimulated uh, and uh, enlightened by a lot of the work that you've done. But I think there's an interesting dimension in Namibia, which is really not researched to the best of my knowledge. And that is the link between anthropologists and the, and the old South East African police. And what is fascinating, if you look at the, at not only what the police did, particularly the so-called security police people, but the sources they draw on. Uh, I have, for example, a collection of the Namibian security police. And uh, they comprise, and you're welcome to see it, they comprise a great many works from anthropologists. Uh, so that is interesting. Uh, that's extraordinarily interesting. 
And, uh, you know, some of the titles are quite deviant, you know, the sexual behavior of, of the Negro, things like that. Uh, and that, I think, is also interesting, fits into this bigger picture, as you say. Uh, quite absurd, actually, but uh, you're welcome, actually. I've got the whole collection. I got it from uh, one of the very senior uh, security police people who's now farming in the south of the country. I hope this to you. Uh, but you're welcome. And, and it's an interesting dimension. As far as I know, people haven't actually done any research on that topic. And I, I think clearly it doesn't <coughs> overall to this theme that you are exploring in this book of yours. It's just a comment. It's not yes, I appreciate that. You're welcome. John. Yeah, I'm also staying up. Robert, um, fabulous book. Um, really interesting discussion. I had a comment for Dr. Nakua, I think coming from something you were saying about failed colonial projects. And I think we can all say 30 years afterwards that the big hearts and minds project happily failed. Um, Although one does wonder to what extent that tinkering with the social dynamics of people in that part of the country might have had lasting effects. I don't think it's easy to tease them out. But when we speak of needing to write our own history as people from that area, the dominance of these colonial contributions is ensured by the fact that they are, for the most part, the only thing on the table. And they will remain dominant, even things that are, that exist only in archival form, when in, in, in unpublished form, have a huge dominance. They have a, they cast this very long shadow over the Libyan scholarship. And there's an enormous amount of work to be done there. I also think that um, there is another species of camouflaged ethnologist um, on the prowl in the middle. I'm very interested in the thinking behind community conservation, the way that community relations with nature the way that rural communities are characterized through, um, um, what do we call it, CBNRM? Yes. Um, I have a feeling that has a very close kinship with that type of ethnology we thought we had buried. Mm. It's come back in that form. And our government promotes it. You, you will see the way that rural communities' traditions are promoted as tourists attractions. It's the same thing. Not in camouflage, but in khaki this time. <laughs> so I think there's a lot of work to be done on that account. Thank you. In this element of disobedience among anthropologists working for the state. So uh, were really all of them uh, delivering blindly what the state wanted to see, or there were like a hidden and perhaps conspiracy among some of them? I mean, were it really, I mean, were some of them critical about all what the state was wanting to do, and how big was this? Was um, And how, how did the state deal with them? So did they just kick out, or were they just uh, pressuring them, or blackmailing them? They were, there were some very interesting debates going on. Again, I must say, you know, you, I, I've come across some moral issues, and in fact, some of the government ethnologists will critique the government. Uh, the most famous case, Kula Buddha, uh, who, when he came here, there was the Martin Ashikoto case in the Bongo, where a uh, habitual thief had had his eyes put out. And, Bad, the Department of Veterans Administration wanted him out. And Buddha came up as an expert witness for Ashikota. And basically, the Bantu administration said, You can 
never go up to the, beyond the police zone. They wanted to fire in the chief ethnologist in Pretoria, Van Marvel, that I had to fly up and clean. No, please keep this guy. Um, I've also seen him, he critiqued the Windhoff Commission reports making the Nama Cullens. Uh, we can talk about why they did that, but he was very heavy in his. But you know, it was muted. And you know, he's got great diplomatic skills, and he manages to play around like that. But there, there were people, and then I mean, in Omega Camp too, it was an anthropologist, a military anthropologist, who objected to what was going on, but overridden by the senior officials, who didn't really take anthropologists seriously. I mean, you read the, the military response to these military people, these ethnologists. And it's ridiculous. I mean, they had no time for them, but they were part, they were staff officers. And in fact, in one of my articles, I made the argument that the ethnography which they were doing, ethnology, which is sort of wrote listing of things, was worth more to Swapo than it was to the SADF because it was so confusing and just plain wrong. Yeah, you should read the etiquette manuals. I mean, it's a wonderful literature. You want to see how not to write an etiquette man. Yeah, it's all the others so different. And above all, you've got to avoid black women because they do all sorts of things and you can sort of tie that into the immorality act and all sorts of interesting things. But they were very much part of that parcel. And it sort of goes back to the nature of higher education in this country too. We have rote learning at the Afrikaans universities at that stage, which you didn't question the professor. And the whole thing about this book is it's not so much about anthropologists, it's about experts. What makes an expert an expert? What credentials do they have? And what is expertise? Is it simply a performance act where you impress people with credibility? How do you get credibility? So it, it tries to go beyond the narrow and sort of go to the universal issues of doubt. You know, what makes an expert an expert? Especially a social scientist or someone who claims to be a social scientist because that scientist, you know, like political scientists, get what a stupid fable. <laughs> it's absurd. Yeah. How scientific can you be in politics? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, sorry, there's a question from someone on the Yeah, uh, so the question is to all the panelists and it's from that minister. He, his question is what was and is the place and space of the Namibian scientific society in having crafted or crafting? colonial and apartheid ethnography. The cover of the book does provide suggestions on that. I think, I think here's also a thing about this place where we are today. Uh, I think because we've paid, we're not going to kick us out. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the, Thank that, that for the question, but I, I, I can only say that the certainly the, the scholarship was, which was being produced from here was also skewed to a certain to a certain site, uh, and, 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 I, and I think uh, uh, Rob provides some insights to to, to, to the effect uh, in, in his book. But besides that, I also wanted to just briefly comment, um, taking from my brother there, I didn't get his name. Uh, John, yes. Uh, when you say that all this data is, is still there uh, and it's going to be there for a long time, and then I would like to start by saying that when the natives begin to speak back, um, uh, how much time is this native going to need and how much resources is he or she going to need uh, so that they can begin to speak back? And I think um, probably this is where this native is speaking back. Uh, at least <laughs> you, 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 had, you had that opportunity to engage with this archive. And I was all, almost going to ask that, how do you do it? You know, like, how, do you, how do you get this information? Uh, or how do you get these links so that you get access to this kind of data, which is very which is, which is very, which is very good? Because I can also say the same thing that by the time many of these things were written, Kapoor has already written about some of the 
many important things, uh, for example, in the Kalamu. And, uh, and, and one could sense that they were, this led to the trouble in the Catholic Church uh, at the time uh, when he was writing. But he was not being used by the administration of the time. Uh, remember, of course, he's also one of the people who already got a PhD uh, in the country, black for that matter. So it's really the issue of power relations and who is, who is keeping the game. But there's also a level of denialism when it comes to archives. Once you have a piece of archival evidence, then you don't really quite show that you have that information. Because like on the issue of winning the hearts and minds, there are a lot of key people, for example, now in the current administration, who were administrators of this process. And when we're asking them about this question, they deny it completely that they, they did not know about this thing. While you have a picture of, of let's say, the newspaper that was being produced at the time, the, Picture is there, either the person was a vice chairperson or was a secretary of a Zumba or was, and so on. Mm -hmm. So there's also this level of denialism of wanting to appear to have been this very serious person uh, in the, during the, that moment, which was very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's also a challenge we have to really deal with. But on the issue of the success of winning hearts and minds, we have to <laughs> the extent it has gone. I think we can just enjoy it where we're saying that. Um, <coughs> The government started to use some of these methods. I got in trouble for writing against living museums in Namibia. Um, uh, when, when you get that, that sense of a person being objectified um, uh, to appear as not having changed or developed to a certain extent, I, I, I don't care what, how you define development, but uh, that is one thing which is there. And this has created high levels of tribal belonging uh, before being in Namibia. So, uh, Prof. Pipisan has taught us this political one, one already yet, you know, to say that there was a time when Christian, Namibians were more Christians than Namibians first. And now they have become more of their tribal or ethnic orientation or belonging uh, than when they are Namibian. So, we have, and this is a project of the time which is still continuing. And I think it only gets replicated in various uh, creative ways so that it doesn't appear to be what it is. So I think uh, the community-based uh, movement is, is, is just the same concept, um, where the narrative is of protecting um, so that it doesn't disappear. But we are moving forward. <coughs> investments, investments are coming in at the expense of what people think locally and so on. So what do, you, what do you really do? So I think it's a dilemma we have, and as social scientists or anthropologists, we, we really have to start asking these very serious questions. Um, uh, as, as we write. And I think it's also high time that we need to start advocating for more scholarship support for those uh, that are in this, in this field. Because when you look at the, at the, the model of, of, of scholarship support in Namibia, it's very skewed to what I call hard sciences. Yet we have got serious problems, social problems which the government cannot deal with. So how do, how do you have, how many, in the paper recently it was, how many social workers for X number, hundreds of people in the country. So it doesn't, it doesn't quite make sense at all. So that's why I think we as scholars or we as uh, people who are really in this field, we need to start advocating for this. Raised by our brother there, John Kina. It's very important that, of course, the archives is colonially dominated. The documents, the materials that we have there, is that which was left there by the colonists. And now how do we write a different history from that? Because that continues to, to dominate, eh? to influence upon our studies. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is where uh, critical theory comes in. Uh, for example, before history was written as a man's thing, eh? Uh, men were the dominant uh, characters in the history. But uh, theories came up, feminism, for example, using the same material that the men were using uh, would, with critical theory of feminism. You come up with a different history where women also features it. That is the same. Like, uh, I think I have written somewhere that this book adds to our critical theory of uh, 
understanding of this. Because the same materials, colonial history, that we have, for example, my colleague here have cited Harold Eats, Kankale, Kankare, and Kokihan, who are very valid by their nature. In actual fact, all the interviews that we have had with the eyewitnesses, we had the opportunity, at least by the time we started interviewing, to have some eyewitnesses, uh, people that were there. And all of them, all of them, testified to the violence and their abusive nature. But, in what they wrote, in the reports that they wrote to their superior event, you will not see a single incident where they report on their own violence. But now, we can write a true uh, picture of what they really stood for. Because now, we have listened to the other side. That's why there have been some projects with the National Archives over the past few years. I think our brother Vena here can testify. Where they promoted oral research and funded people to go out there and uh, bring information, oral research, so that we, we also deposit it in the National Archives. So as to serve as a counter <laughs> voice to the dominant colonial narrative. So I think that question is very, very important, and that is one of the ways that uh, we, we should deal with it. And on the scientific society, I think our professor will say a lot about it. He has, of course, written about it uh, already in his book. But uh, we have seen that uh, there are articles, uh, journal articles, that were published in the scientific journal, not only before independence, but even after independence, without the input or the eye of uh, some other experts. Because that time will come when we will look at and we will review these uh, journal articles. Uh, from our point of view, they are poorly written and they, 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 they are not, uh, they do not represent the true picture of what really happened. I've written a paper, a chapter in the book, Reviewing Resistance, I mean, in the book called Reviewing Resistance in Namibian History. That chapter is called uh, the Vandiripul Shara Massacre Revisited. The main purpose why I wrote that is actually to, to say that there's another story, apart from that one which is written there. So I think that is all that I can say for <coughs> about the scientific society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, mm, the, the question from John Pinahan has been well answered by my colleagues. Maybe just to add a little bit on the whole question of what that's all we have available. It's true uh, that we have from the colonial past, but uh, as my colleagues have already mentioned, maybe now we can start thinking of how to study the colonial archive. I think there's been a lot of discussions uh, here in academia on how do we study, how do we use the colonial archives. Uh, uh, we know, for example, from some of the readings uh, on studying the colonial archive that uh, we now come to understand that uh, the colonial archive mainly stood, uh, it's actually, even when they speak about the subject, uh, they speak about the, the view of the state about the subject. It does not represent the people themselves. It's the position of the state about what they thought about the colonial subject. So we need to critically read. Uh, is it alone or is the grain? I think that's one of those words uh, that they, they have been using, studying alone or against the grain. Well, we need to really look at what the possibility of the other side using the same materials. Maybe that is definitely one way. So, and uh, continuity in terms of what was there before independence and after independence especially when you look at some of those developmental projects. It's true, I think uh, it has also been equally mentioned by the colleagues that uh, 
So there seems to be some continuity in terms of uh, uh, what was happening during the colonial period in terms of community projects to what is happening now. But I think for the government, maybe and for all of us, uh, what is important is that we should now look very critically and see uh, what can we learn from the past uh, experiences, the, the past experiences of this project. And if we are really doing the same projects, what shall we do different? So I think uh, maybe that is the approach to go about it. Thank you, sir. The Gandhas in their sweater stars. Now, what's interesting is that his sweater star was actually as horrible as he's been said. Of course, they get a loud exposed. And she specifically, I mean, referred to the thing. He said, you see, Africans are tribes. And the tribalists you see, actually always, inside the tribe, you see, they actually have to see a, a fight for. Ranking, top ranking, and then there's inside a bit of a situation, but outside everybody actually kills everybody. So that actually was actually one of the things that he actually said. Now, the one thing he is, one you can actually say, in addition to that, Feta knew Guerrero and quite a few other African languages, and he actually knew the stories. Now, as a matter of fact, you can actually. That in the Augustinium, you see, he was actually a guy that people who actually then founded the Oruano. And Zakir uh, Thomas, you see, in, in, in Kirtmans, who, who actually founded the AMD Church, they liked better because, you see, they knew that he knew a lot. So you actually have to take better things and get, you see, the, the people's voices out of it. Because, you see, in what he writes, you see, there are also the people's voices in it. Uh, I mean, Kiryu Zundermeyer was actually much, much better than that, you see, but uh, uh, Tennessee is actually a, a funny kind of character. Thank you very much for coming.